Hello, uh, welcome to the webinar focusing on sports as a tool to support refugee integration, education and empowerment. I'm Vlad Spencer, I, I'm talking to you even if my background does not indicate somewhere uh, around Washington DC in the United States. Our co-moderator Anna Tadevosian is in Yerevan, Armenia. Uh, this webinar is part of the International uh, Sports Programming Initiative of the State Department, Sports Diplomacy Division, and is produced by World Learning and uh, Digital Communication Network. Uh, during our sports diplomacy exchanges, uh, sports exchanges, the ones that you know, we are doing when life is normal, means after, before COVID, after COVID, we had opportunities to, to visit refugee camps with our programs. Because I remember, you know, in Turkey, Jordan, South Sudan, and, and definitely, you know, personally, you know, felt the, the intense emotion and, and, and sadness when talking to different people. And I remember uh, at some point in, in Turkey talking to a father of, of, of four, and he, he was telling me how, how his life was turned upside down when he had to very quickly, um, you know, leave Syria. And, and not far from the, him, kind of in the background is of this whole thing, there were his kids, and his kids were playing, were playing football, you know, what we call here in the United States, soccer. And, and you know, obviously, you know, the first thought that comes to mind that, that kids are kids, and, and they don't need a lot you know, around them to, to play, to play the game they love, to play the game they're accustomed to. And, and I felt at that time that, you know, for the adults and, and for the kids, uh, they, are, they are all looking for, for glimpses of normalcy in, in, in their lives. And, and, and sports was one way to, to achieve that. Uh, but sports can play um, many other roles in, in refugee integration, in refugee development, um, you know, training for all kinds of, uh, you know, professions, uh, uh, cultural integrations in communities. And our goal in, in this webinar is to discuss uh, the role of sports in trying to achieve uh, this immersion for, for refugees uh, and maybe build some skills and help them integrate. Um, you know, which challenges, for example, uh, do existing programs uh, have? You know, what are the best strategies or what are the best attitudes, practices when working uh, with sports and refugees? So we are privileged to, to have an amazing panel today in order to you know, tackle all, this, all these issues. Uh, people from the United States, Switzerland, Jordan, we hope Uganda, that means you know, we're not able so far to, um, to have uh, the, the link uh, working, but we are, we are trying, you know, we are, we are trying to get our speaker from Uganda as well. Uh, by now, uh, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, all of you are, are very familiar with Zoom. Um, we count on your questions in, in the chat room. Just keep in mind that, that uh, these webinars are made in, you know, uh, possible for two reasons, obviously to exchange information about different things related to the topic, but also to network. So please feel free to let us know who you are. Please feel free to um, you know, post links that might be useful for everybody. And our hope is that everybody is going to keep in touch after this and will create our community of uh, um, people who are passionate about, about these issues. Uh, so uh, one other you know, technical aspects, when we, when we don't speak, when we don't speak, please mute your mics. Uh, to, to maximize uh, the, the sound quality. So that's the introduction. Um, you know, that being said, uh, welcome. Um, I will switch and I will, I will look at the chat right now and, and hopefully we'll get your questions very quickly. We got some questions from people who registered uh, for the webinar. Uh, but for now, um, Anna, you have the floor uh, for the introduction segment with the speakers. Thank you, Vlad. And I want to welcome all the participants and all the speakers. We have an amazing lineup of speakers. And I will start with our first speaker, Nick Sor. Uh, he's a senior refugee sports coordinator in UN High Commissioner for Refugees from Switzerland. Nick, hello and welcome to our panel. Hi, Anna. How are you? Good. So I will share your, uh, your PowerPoint and we can start. OK. I want to ask uh, to all the speakers and first, uh, Nick, how you use support for refugee integration? Okay, I mean, I think um, uh, when I discussed this with you guys earlier, I mean, I think that uh, what UNHCR can do here is possibly give a give a big picture overview, um, and and uh, you know we're very happy to do that, or I'm very happy to do that. 
I wanted to start, uh, Anna, if I can, maybe with uh, with the next slide, and just to just to remind uh, everybody who we're talking about here. Um, so for, for those, many of you will be familiar with these statistics, but perhaps some of you are not. And just quickly to, to, to recap, um, uh, currently uh, the UNHCR's global statistics uh, indicate that there are roughly 80 million forcibly displaced people uh, in the world. That's, uh, that's roughly one in every hundred people on the planet. Uh, so next time you go to the cinema, the, there's a few of those people in there that are uh, if we ever go to the cinema again, there'll be a few of those people in there that, that uh, would represent the world's displaced people. 26 million of those are refugees, uh, and, and uh, which means they've been forced to flee across an international border, uh, and 20.4 million are under the mandate of, of my organisation, the UN Refugee Agency, uh, with uh, another 5.6 million being under the mandate of UNRWA, uh, which is the dedicated to Palestinian refugees. Uh, and uh, significantly, you'll see that uh, um, five countries produce 68% uh, um, of, of, of the world's refugee flow. So Syria, Venezuela, Afghanistan, South Sudan, and Myanmar. Um, so that's just a quick recap of who we're talking about here. Next slide, please, Anna. And then just to, to kind of frame the discussion, I mean, I think there's a, uh, you know, it's important to 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 recognise that uh, when we're talking about refugees and sport, this isn't a this isn't a new area of uh, uh, of conversation or new area of work. Uh, UNHCR's uh, records, which date back to to uh, post uh, immediately after the Second World War, and with UNHCR's predecessor, the International Refugee Organisation, uh, indicate that sports was a was a central activity in many of the uh, the, the post-World War II refugee camps. Uh, the, the picture of young women playing basketball there is from Italy uh, in, in 1944, uh, 1946, sorry. Uh, and the, uh, the picture in the bottom right-hand corner is actually uh, of uh, amputees who, who engaged in a, a mini Olympics competition uh, in Newburgh in Germany. Uh, and and these, these amputees also uh, facilitated the, the clearing of a of a, of a pitch to play to play sports games, and then uh, as time has has gone on, sports has become a kind of a, a, a um, uh, played a bigger role in 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 the protection and development of young refugees. And just some of just some of these pictures are um, the Somali winners winners of the first Refugee World Cup. There's the Refugee uh, Olympic team from 2016, which was the IOC Refugee Olympic team. Uh, there is a, a team of uh, Portuguese refugees, uh, sorry, uh, yes, uh, uh, refugees uh, in, uh, um, uh, ooh, uh, a team of refugees that uh, got together following their, uh, their displacement uh, and, and formed a football team and so on. So we can see that there, you know, sports uh, is, uh, is kind of an ever present in, in, in refugee situations. And, and I think this, this kind of iconic picture of a, of a, uh, uh, you know, a, a bundle of cloths wrapped together with a piece of string, which, uh, uh, you know, many of us will have seen personally in, in uh, displacement settings of kids kicking around these kinds of things when, when for other balls, etc., are not available. Okay, next slide, please, Anna. So for UNHCR, when we think about the refugee sport ecosystem, who are we talking about? And I think there's a uh, um, you, you know, we have this this kind of uh, uh, split and, uh, in in different types of organisations. So then there's the there's the uh, the plus sports side and the sports plus side. And I don't like to necessarily use those terms per se, but you know we see that there are there is a you know heavy engagement from the international sports organisations, sports for development actors, sports federations and associations, and professional clubs, and then you know the community based organisations. As we go further down, that includes uh, local sports clubs and refugee-led organisations. Then, from the from the kind of development uh, uh, and humanitarian side, there's UN agencies such as my organisation, but you know UNICEF and UNFPA and, and ILO and lots of others, humanitarian NGOs, uh, um, child protection agencies, youth development organisations, faith actors. Uh, and uh, not forgetting uh, academics and academic institutions and, and, and also government, government agencies and ministries of youth and sports uh, and, and ministries of education and so on. And we see quite a, quite a clear geographical split as well in terms of 
uh, you know, the different kinds, the different ways that organizations are working in different areas. In Europe, we have a, a you know, a very, uh, a very strong um, sports uh, for development uh, arena where integration of refugees and, and migrants through sport is a, is a, you know, is a very um, large area of work. Uh, in, in other areas, we see uh, we see that uh, you know sports plays a, a particular role, um, but with a, with a lot more international actors um, and um, you know less less local actors having having access to resources for that. And then we see that obviously the different types of sports uh, that that we engage in. So football uh, is is the you know is the global game and is the one that we see most in in refugee context. But martial arts are also are also very popular and, and, and traditional games and lots of others. Okay, next slide, Anna, please. And then, and then really just to, uh, to finish off, um, I think the, um, the areas that, that we see the kind of key engagement of sports entities in uh, are fivefold. Um, so the, the projects and, and programs and, and building of evidence of, of the impact uh, that sport can have, the outcomes that we can achieve through through sport and UNHCR, um, you know, works with lots of different partners uh, in this regard. Um, the Olympic Refuge Foundation have projects in in, in numerous places and are implementing a, a sport for protection uh, approach that uh, was was co-developed with UNHCR and, and the Child Protection Agency TED is on. The uh, the Educate a Child program of uh, education above all. Uh, are now integrating sport into their primary level uh, programs, and, and they're a huge funder of uh, primary education in refugee contexts. Uh, another uh, another uh, uh, educational partner, Jesuit Worldwide Learning, have developed a, a, a training program for young refugees to get accredited uh, training as sports facilitators. And and the the English Football Association, uh, you know, are, are looking at uh, the. The way that uh, sport uh, uh, sport can, uh, and specifically football in this case, can support the integration of refugees in in, in England and, and Wales. Um, communication and advocacy advocacy efforts are are obviously key, and sport can play a big role in this. And uh, UNHCR and the uh, the Olympic uh, Committee co-convened a, a coalition of sports organisations, which you know uh, many of you on the call will already be part of. Uh, around the Global Refugee Forum last year, and uh, there was communication efforts around this, and continuing communication efforts, and and to 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 put the the refugee story out there and use that the the platform that sports provides is really important. Um, sports also provides pathways for refugees to to uh, to to be part of the world that that uh, they they perhaps never perceived they could be, and and I think a really good example of this is the Refugee Olympic Team. From uh, from Rio in 2016, and a, a lot of the federations, a lot of the sports federations are working in this area and providing opportunities for young refugees to engage in in competition at national and international levels. And, and in Kakuma Refugee Camp in Kenya, there's a, a both a men's and women's team of, of refugees and host community young people who play in the national league. Uh, sports diplomacy is also a, a huge area. A, 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 where sports can have a significant role and, and the refugee teams again play a role in this, but goodwill ambassadors who are who are from the sports world, sports personalities. I mean, I think uh, a certain BBC uh, sports presenter, Gary Lineker, is a, is a very good example of, uh, of this and, and the way that he supports refugee issues. And then obviously the engagement of, of uh, leaders in, in the refugee space in, in uh, activities and events around sports and then finally um, I think you know none of this is possible uh, without the the, re the resource mobilization and, and that's not just uh, financial resources but more and more uh, it's the mobilization of expertise and human and other resources and, and this is what makes well, it possible. Baba. Hmm? Well, Baba has been Okay, um, that's, a, that's a quick overview. Thank you, Anna, and, and back to you. Thank, thank you, Nick, it was very useful information. We'll go back to you. We have questions, but we will ask the same question to our next um, speaker. Seren Frayat, Executive Director, Life and Change Experience Through Sports from USA. Seren, 
Welcome. Thank you very much. Um, well, I'm the founder and executive director of LACES, and I'm hoping the perspective that I can bring today is really how the opportunity I had for to be integrated into another culture and how that inspired the experience that we have with refugees here in the US. So in 2006, I was volunteering with an organization in Liberia, West Africa, um, we convert old cruise liners into hospitals. And during that experience, um, it was right after Liberia's 14 year civil war, shortly after. I was actually just on the ship for a couple of weeks and I got off the ship and um, was out playing a pickup soccer game. I had played in college and there was a women's professional team in Liberia and they saw me playing and recruited me to play women's professional soccer in Liberia. Uh, it was quite the experience. And for me, it was the first time that sports had become more than a game. Prior to that, it was about winning and losing and I didn't really see it beyond that. So this experience allowed me to step on the soccer field, cross cultural barriers, um, be part of a group of women who had experienced 14 year civil war and I knew nothing about that, what that was like. And they took me in as family. They made me part of their homes. Um, they invited me in. I got to see, you know, hear from them what trauma was like for the 14 year civil war. I got to, you know, I was challenged by the coach one day, um, you know, of just about the competitive spirit of the, of the game at that particular moment. And I just, I just felt like, you know, competition might not have been at, at the, the motivation behind the team. And he, he very quickly and easily just said, you know, Saren, really, this is more than a game. These women have just lived through 14 years of civil war. And this is a brief outlet time away from their difficult lives to enjoy. Um, so that really informed my uh, foundation of LACES. And um, if we can go back to, can you go back a few slides for me? And one more. There we go. Um, I think so we skipped, if you could advance forward with just one more, that would be great. Okay, so this is me playing um, professional soccer in Liberia. The team is pro anchor. And as you can see, you know, it just took a short period of time for me to become friends with these women. That inspired laces, like I said, and we've been around for 13 years now. You can advance the slide. And we do sports for development programs in Liberia, West Africa, Sierra Leone, and we work with um, refugees here in the Washington DC area. Next slide. So, you know, 10 years later after starting LACES, I really started to look in our local community in Washington, D.C. to see what is the group of kids that are really um, not being served, who, who is not, you know, um, who are looking for integration to be part of something bigger. And I really, you know, refugees stood out to us. So we hosted our first ever soccer camp and we had 50 kids from 14 different countries that spoke seven different languages. Now that's just a lot of people doing a lot of different things, trying to cross cultural barriers. Not only did we have our coaches who really didn't know much about the um, you know, refugee experience, what it was like here in the US, what it meant for resettlement here. And you know, one of our goals is to work with most recently resettled refugee youth, which means that if English was not their primary language, um, those 14 different languages, you know, English was just not there, but we could all bond around the uh, common sport of soccer. And it became this pathway where these kids grew in their personalities. And, you know, two kids on the team in particular, they didn't know each other. They both lived in the same apartment complex, um, specifically in DC, many refugees are resettled in a concentrated area. And they lived in the same area for a year, but then they met at our soccer camp. Um, one is from Afghanistan and one was from Uganda, and now they're the best of friends. When they first met, they couldn't speak each other's language, but the power of sport brought them together. It gave them, them this opportunity to um, excel in life, feel part of something. I can go to the next slide. Beyond the soccer camps, we then started getting, you know, soccer teams, smaller group of kids where they could be mentored by coaches who actually intentionally were you know, um, from the US who, you know, had never 
really connected with refugee population. And that was just so we had cross-cultural learning and understanding and they could, you know, refugees could learn about American culture. The, you know, US, those from the US who were coaches could really understand more about the refugee experience. So we can kind of you know, have this experience of walking in each other's shoes, so to speak. I'm not sure that's quite possible, but they could really start to understand each other's lives a little bit more. I think one of the things that we, um, you can go back a slide a little bit. Okay. One of the things that we actually found with our coaches was, you know, so for example, in the beginning, we had kids from, you know, 50 kids, 14 different countries, but they're all refugees. The thing is, is that I think the challenge that we face is that, um, at least for our coaches and those we've engaged with, is that people, you know, bring them in as they're all refugees. So they, they lump them into this one group, when in reality, they're, you know, 50 different kids with different experiences, you know, their refugee experience was different, how they found themselves come to the United States was different. And so it became an, a, a way that we really had to talk our coaches through it and do more onboarding and provide more explanation of how, you know, we look at kids in the US and we say, okay, this kid is this person, this kid is this person, this kid. And um, they weren't seeing them as the individuals that they were. In addition to that was the kids, you know, we had 14 different countries and some of these kids were, you know, families were at, at war with one another and they were here now living with each other. And we saw bullying happen and um, still happens. And it was a surprise to many of the coaches and we just had to make it clear, like these are kids and Unfortunately, bullying happens and we need to talk to them about that. That's, you know, our role, responsibility to, you know, just guide them. But they're really, they're like every other 10 year old. Um, they just had a different experience in life than what we all know. And I think that's really key for when we're looking at integration is that people have different experiences and um, how we can bridge sports to come together. Um, Another thing that we do with our um, sports program is, you can change the next slide, is, so we have a soccer program that's, you know, specifically for refugees. And then we have an adventure camp. This kid is doing a, a 50 foot, I think, or um, climbing wall. And we bring smaller group of kids who are refugee youth and non-refugee youth. They come together and they do team building. Uh, we do ropes courses, um, climbing wall, the, the, you know, scavenger hunts, all kinds of stuff that's team building, but it puts everyone on a, you know, a level surface. I mean, most kids I would imagine haven't done a lot of rock climbing or done high ropes courses. And we put them up in pairs and they start eating together and they start, you know, becoming friends. You know, they don't necessarily speak the same language, but they really begin to connect around this common bond. And by the end of the week, you know, kids are exchanging, you know, contact information and wanting to get together and trying to find ways to connect outside of this experience. So I would encourage that sports can look like different things. And I, I think it's the um, environment that you create around it, that this is team, we are learning, we want to be part of this. And, and one thing we found is, you know, a few examples with um, one of the kids in our program, we, he had just started with our program when he had been recently resettled. He couldn't speak English, didn't actually know how to play soccer, but had some friends that were coming and were like, hey, yeah, come play. Um, joined one of our teams and a year later, he loves soccer. He goes and plays pickup soccer all the time with, you know, kids from all different backgrounds, kids in his school. He's gained friends from that. And then actually he spoke in a group of 100 people in front of him at a fundraising event a year later. So I guess I, I hope the connection that I'm trying to be able to communicate is that sports crosses these cultural barriers, but we have to go beyond that. And we have to be able to educate those that are part of the entire experience, um, you know, both the youth and the coaches on how to best um, utilize this opportunity and what it can be. And, you know, 
but kids just want to connect. And this is an, a common language that we can all use to connect because we all know sports. Um, I think that's all I, I have for right now, but you know, when the opportunity is there, happy to answer questions. Thank you very much. This is an amazing job you do with the oldest kids and helping them to overcome the barriers. There are many questions, but we'll come back later. So our, our next speaker is Dr. Ayat Nashwan from Jordan, social work professor, Yarmouk University. Thank Dr. So Ayat, welcome to our panel. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with you today. I really greatly appreciate your invitation. I would like you to know that I have also two uh, colleagues, uh, one of them, um, Tim Stickler, who is with us now attending this uh, webinar, and also Dr. Nashwan Nashwan. So Tim has a degree in education, and Dr. Nashwan has a degree in physical education, and I, my area of interest, my area of research actually in social work. So we formed this team together in order to do this research. But before that, I would like to say that uh, two inspiration points um, led to this uh, ongoing research. Actually, we did not finish the research yet. The first one is while um, I done my PhD in Tennessee, in Knoxville, I get to know Dr. Ashley Huffman, who is who also with us uh, today. I saw her name, so I greet her from this um, platform. And she was running a program on uh, sport and peace, uh, working with Iraqi refugees. So. This is the first starting point where I thought, yeah, sport has a connection with refugees. I returned back to Jordan after that, and I get in contact with uh, Tim Stickler, who came to Jordan to do his research, and we published one research together about art and healing. And then I was having more questions about the extracurricular activities like sport and uh, art, how, and how that can contribute to the well-being and healing uh, for refugees. And this project came uh, to see the light. So my research title is The Role of Extracurricular Activities in Improving the Social and Psychological Well-being of Syrian Refugee Children in Jordan. And as I said, we are three people doing this research together. To give you some background about Jordan, the number of Syrian refugees in Jordan, actually, according to um, uh, Census of Bureau, is 1. million. More than half of refugees who came to Jordan are children and women, which means that they are one of the most vulnerable um, um, uh, groups in uh, refugees. 15% um, of refugees are residing in the four camps in Jordan, including Zatari and Azraq and other two camps, and 85% are outside the camps. And uh, in this research, actually, we try to take the perspective of the teachers instead of uh, talking directly to the students or to the kids to see the effect or the impact of um, sport on them. And actually we designed um, semi-structured interview uh, where we asked uh, the teachers about many um, issues. So for example, we asked them about the issues that uh, students um, have uh, during the sport, what are the activities that they have, and I would like to indicate that this is within the informal and formal settings. So we get some responses from teachers who teach in the camp within the informal um, system and also outside the camp to see also the differences between both. And also we ask them about what social and psychological problems can they notice um, within while teaching the students, like for example, the isolation, the shyness, all of these aspects that are related to psychological and also the social. Um, also, we asked some questions about the personalities, how they feel that the personality of the students improved while uh, they are taking these classes. We also asked them what are the obstacles that may hinder opportunities for sport teaching um, in, in the students. Um, so far, we received actually 50 responses. And these 50 responses, almost half of them from uh, teachers inside the camps and the other 50% uh, is from teachers outside the camps. And uh, uh, we noticed that from the primary data that we, we, we uh, analyzed that 
there is a variation between the years of experience among teachers. So we have a teachers with uh, 15 years of experience and others who, who are uh, recently graduated. And this is, will surely have a specific impact on, on the results. So um, after designing this interview, we intended to do face-to-face uh, -face interviews. But as you know, uh, the majority of empirical research now moved to be online. So uh, what we've done that part of these um, interviews done uh, through Zoom and others about convenience for the, the teachers, they prefer to have it as an uh, online link. So we designed online link uh, on Google so they can in their free time uh, fill uh, this online questionnaire. And these are actually the results we got. Before that, I would like to say that there is a new research done in Lebanon and published in September 2020, done by uh, Carby and Diana, and indicates very important uh, also result um, that programs of crisis affected childhood and sport for development formula predominantly remain universalized models, failing to incorporate local specificities despite increasing campaigns to promote contextualization approaches. So one of the primary results that we found from analyzing these interviews, that the teacher said that there is more support that is given to sport activities inside the camps comparing to sport activities outside the camps. And this is something we should really um, highlight because this is a very important. That means that kids inside the camp, they get more attention, they get more um, interest or concern from the international and local organizations in sport. And we should not forget that all the programs or the activities and education are supported by UNICEF, which means they have totally different approach than the kids who are outside the camps, where some teachers indicate actually that in many ways, um, uh, the classes of sport or art are taken to be given for other activities like teaching math, for example. So the cultural or the context is not really encouraging giving the classes uh, the right way. Unfortunately, this is something the culture people always care about the, the math classes, English, but they less uh, care about sport. And this is from our opinion as people in the academia is a problem because sport also can um, have an impact on uh, strengthening the, the, the confidence uh, in the child also. Um, the trust, um, uh, also one of the speakers, I forget who, uh, mentioned also the team. How can we build team? So uh, students or kids can learn a lot from uh, sport. And we should not forget that the schools in Jordan are also combined of Jordanian students and Syrian. So some students, some, uh, sorry, some uh, schools, they have both together in the same shift, but other schools have Syrians only uh, in the second shift because uh, according to the capacity, unfortunately, we don't have space for uh, kids. So uh, the Jordanian system is to um, uh, uh, create the second shift for uh, the kids. Also, other points I would like to uh, quickly raise. Um, the first one is the support for uh, sport activities is more appear in the, um, um, in the camp setting and less in the urban areas. Um, also, uh, many teachers indicate that the, the fund that comes to support sport, sport in, the, in the schools in many ways is unsustainable. So it's temporary, it's for a specific time, it's a project comes for, let's say, two, three, four years, and then uh, unfortunately it disappears. And this is a problem because they indicate the importance of sport should be part of the system and it should be not um, as unsustainable uh, a program. Um, these are so far actually um, the ideas or the, the, the primary results that we found in this research. And uh, our plan to finish this research by uh, end of this year, and hopefully it will be published in the beginning of the 2021. Thank you so much. I am um, again grateful to this opportunity and greeting from Jordan. Thank you very much. Perfect, thank you. Thank you very much. I hope you will share your research with everyone because I think everybody now is interested in your research. So hopefully it will be published next year and we'll have the copy. Uh, so I'll move to our next speaker and the last speaker, Yetet So, Senior Program Coordinator at Soccer Without Borders from US. 
Uh, Yata, welcome. And please tell us how you use soccer for the integration of refugees. Sorry. Cool. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Yatet So, and I would actually just like to start off by giving a couple shout outs to some Sag Without Borders people in the audience. Um, I also would like to say that um, a lot of the things that I'm going to speak on, it's already been touched a lot. I think there's some really amazing people in this panel and um, a lot of our, we, we're doing great, great work and we're here for all together. And I think there's so many layers of what sort of work uh, we're doing. And I would just like to share a little bit about myself. I am um, originally, uh, I was born in Myanmar, I was born in Thailand and um, we settled to the state as a refugee in 2000, um, we lived in a refugee camp. Uh, for three years and um, moved to Oakland, California um, in 2000. Um, so I've been been in the U.S. for approximately 20 years. And um, I think we've all have spoken to understanding that soccer is such a universal la language and how much powerful, I mean, how powerful it is to um, a lot of refugees in so many different ways. Growing up in camp, I remember there was only two sports. It was either um, soccer or um, there was this other um kind of like soccer, volleyball sport in, in Thai, Thailand and Burma called Tekra. Um, and those were the two main kind of sport. Um, coming to the U.S., it definitely was very difficult. And I think um, we have um, one of the biggest things that I felt was just like this sense of like not having this sense of belonging. And um, I think the only way I felt integrated in the community, it was through um, sports itself. Um, and how, how much that has shaped me and how much that has gave, given me um, a role in life and also gave me the opportunity to be where I'm at now. So I currently work for an organization called Soccer Without Borders and Soccer Without Borders is uh, uh, an organization that uses soccer as a vehicle for positive change, providing underserved youth um, with a toolkit to overcome obstacle of growth, inclusion, and um, personal success. And there's so many different roles in our program. And my particular role right now is I do a lot of direct service. Um, so similar to um, what uh, Theron was saying that um, a lot of my, my work is also on the ground basis as a coach. And um, we, we try to um, utilize soccer for uh, a greater tool. So our, our program is particularly uh, focuses on three type of um, Kind of activities we use soccer we focus on soccer we focus on education we focus on community um and as as, as you guys can all as, as everybody here soccer is the main thing and that's what we focus on first i think there's a power in just getting everybody into the field first we have this mon mantra called getting them to the field and soccer is the hook we have to use soccer as a hook first to get them there and then slowly integrate them with um, a purpose of education and then continuing community um, engagement. Um, so a lot of these kind of like layers to it because I feel that in a lot of ways, um, soccer is a pathway for so many and so much more greater things. Um, and our program, it's, we do different, we, we are effective because we have, we, we address year round, we, ad sorry, we address um, barriers of access, um, long-term long kind of like year-round investment and also um, investment in our participants. And then study has shown that when you have a, a coach that is invested in players for more than 12 months, you start seeing significant impact changes in their academic and era, and also like um, their psychosocial development. And I think one of the biggest barriers um, coming to this country, a lot of refugee um, players face is that there's a sense of belonging that is lack, there's a sense of, um, family, a sense of um, teamhood, a sense of um, just feeling like they're all alone in this world. And I think soccer is a great way to integrate that. Um, so I am going to pause there because I feel like a lot of these um, questions are going to be asked later. And I do want to have more time for people to ask questions. Um, but again, just like um, everybody here, I am very grateful to be here. And I am looking forward to the question portion of it. So thank you for listening. Perfect. Thank you very much, Yitat. We have questions. I will switch to Vlad and you will uh, ask questions from the participants, Vlad. Thank you, Anna. So um, as you see, um, 
the chat is very active. Uh, we have people from all over the world. So please take the opportunity um, to uh, connect, to exchange you know, uh, contact information. Um, this webinar is meant also as a networking exercise. Uh, before asking some of the questions that were part of the of the chat, and now uh, you know Anna is going to to uh, switch to the chat. So please continue to ask questions. Uh, I will also ask uh, Eric. I know um, um, uh, basically um, not Eric, uh, Nick. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, I know that recently uh, there was um, a Refugee and Sports Week uh, done in cooperation with um, Sports Dev, which is a, an amazing organization. So maybe maybe uh, Nick, you could tell us. A little bit about um, about you know the activities, what happened, you know your conclusions in relation to that important event. Yeah, sure, Vlad. I'd be happy to. I mean, I think uh, um, uh, you know sports is is a fairly new area of focus for UNHCR. Um, uh, you know, we have recognised the the protection dividends that that sport can provide for. For, for quite a while, but uh, you know, it's only recently that we've had dedicated resources, human resources uh, in, in that area. Uh, and so one of the things that we've been hearing for quite a while is that then, you know, there's no kind of uh, dedicated space uh, globally for, uh, for information and for, you know, discussion on, on refugees and, and, and sports. So um, we, we had a, a discussion with Sport and Dev and, and decided to, to uh, work with them to, to provide that space on their platform. And, and on top of that, then to, to try and create some, some momentum around that. Uh, and, and this was the, the, uh, the week of uh, the week on refugees and sports that, uh, that's just gone past. I mean, I think uh, it, was, uh, it was very encouraging to see super engagement from, from organizations um, sharing articles on, on the work that they're doing in the refugee and sports space. Uh, there were 42 different articles shared and, and that will be published on the Sport and Dev website on, on the work that is uh, ongoing on refugees and sports and, and some opinion pieces and some, some kind of more academic pieces, uh, in, uh, you know, all, you know, related to the area of refugees and sports. And, and I'm seeing some familiar names in the, in the chat there today and for people who've contributed to that. Uh, and so thank you to, uh, thank you to all of you. It's very, it's very rich. And, and for anybody who's interested, I would uh, highly recommend that you, uh, that you log on to Sport and Dev and have a look at the, uh, the, the, the refugee sport section of the uh, part of the toolkit section on, on Sport and Dev and just, just have a read through the articles. There's some really, really super, super work going on and super articles uh, um, by people globally. Then I think the, the second uh, part of that was we, we held a webinar um, that was just really uh, um, an introductory webinar to the, to the area of refugees and sport. And then there was a nice blend of, of practitioner, academic, and, and then a, a young refugee themselves uh, um, a young woman called Sunday who plays for a, a, a women's football team in Kakuma refugee camp in Kenya and you know sharing her story of why sport is important for young people in, in Kakuma refugee camp and you know we, we remember that uh, five of the athletes who participated in the, in the uh, refugee team of the Rio Olympics were based in Kakuma refugee camp originally. And so, you know, one of the, one of the huge and amazing outcomes we've seen from, from that uh, event is that the, the huge uptake of sport in Kakuma refugee camp. I mean, you know, you didn't used to see young people out running at seven o'clock in the morning, but you go to Kakuma refugee camp now and you see them out running at seven o'clock in the morning because suddenly it's, it's possible for refugees to, to participate uh, in the in the you know the biggest sporting stage in the world um, when that was that that was never dreamed before so I think that's uh, really important and then the third really the third string to the, the week of action that we uh, that we we did with Sport and Dev was a uh, was a Twitter live with the head of the Olympic Refuge Foundation uh, based in Lausanne in, uh, in in Switzerland and really just a discussion on on the, the refugee and sports space and, and, and their approach and thoughts on, on you know, the, how this, this, uh, this space is gonna develop over the coming years. So um, yeah, thanks for the opportunity to talk about that, Vlad. And I would encourage people to, to have a look at Sport and Dev and, and uh, 
the new section is is up and running and, and there will be more more stuff coming up soon. Yeah, Sports and Dev is an amazing organization and they do uh, lots of sports for development activities that are it, that you know need to be better known and and uh, and I you know I was following the week and it was an amazing event it was an amazing event indeed uh, now um, first question uh, actually uh, from Kevin uh, McHugh and actually Kevin I apologize I'm not going to ask the question that you asked here in in the chat it's an important one that probably you'll get his response in the chat but uh, when you registered uh, you you asked a question about how to build intercultural competence in host communities to eradicate instances of xenophobia, racism, or other, other kind of a negative uh, you know, phenomena that are noticeable when refugees uh, will be integrated. So that's the that's a question for uh, for the whole group. Um, you know, maybe Nick also, if you have a few thoughts at the beginning, and then we'll go through uh, through the panelists. Um, I, I mean, I think that um, uh, you know, for 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 UNHCR. Um, social inclusion and, and social cohesion are two of the, the prime objectives of our sports programming. Uh, and and uh, so the, the social uh, cohesion outcome, um, especially between uh, different ethnic groups and, and uh, different uh, refugee communities, but also with the host community is, is really important. So, I mean, I think sport has a very big role to play here. The you know the 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 de developmental side of this, where um, uh, where young young people and communities come together with a common aim in mind and work to work to uh, achieve something together. Um, you know, uh, uh, goes through the process of of, of building that that uh, that link between individuals and between communities. And and I think that um, you know we, we all know anecdotally there's there's huge. Uh, Huge potential there, and I think we just need more, uh, more hard evidence of uh, of the impact that sport can have in that area. Doctor Ayat, anything about this topic? Um, you know, was including your research. Any 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 thoughts in relation to this uh, topic? Yes, uh, sure. Actually, it's very interesting that uh, this webinar included uh, researchers and practitioners from uh, Jordan and from the U.S. Um, in order to mention some of the differences, so. I think, uh, and this is my own uh, opinion and perspective, that it's more challenging in the context of the US. Why? Because of the diversity. While in Jordan, for example, we have different issues. So the teachers, for example, that I uh, interviewed in this research, they have the same language with the students. So language barrier is not exist at all. Cultural barrier is not exist. Why? Because this is the Levant. So the refugees who came from Syria, are in the history, they, we were one country together, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, and Palestine. So when we think about it as a cultural aspect or even with some uh, sub differences, because we know that also Syrian have some um, uh, differences in, in some areas, but if, if the teachers and the students have the same culture, almost, I could say to be accurate, and they have the same language, we should think of other things like bullying, for example. The majority of the student, the teachers that I interviewed, they mentioned that they use sport in some way or, or another to reduce the bullying among students. So we have students who bully each other. So they mentioned that clearly that sport can uh, achieve um, a kind of social cohesion, we could say, because we also should admit that in some ways we have some issues between the refugees and the host communities, even if they speak the same language and they have the same culture. But for, from my perspective, what I saw, I believe it's more challenging when the teacher uh, actually deal with kids who are having uh, different languages and different uh, cultures. And they saw that clearly uh, very diverse in, in, in the US. This is my opinion, thank you. So let's let's hear from um, our our guests, our speakers from the U.S. Uh, Soren, any any thoughts? Yeah, I think you know I touched on it a little bit earlier. In for us, what we've seen is smaller groups, um, one on one education. We do um, trainings with um, whether it's churches or institutions or speaking to college courses and classes and a lot of that is just you know 
discussing the things that, you know, in the US, we, it's a challenge. <laughs> and it's, it's something that's come to the forefront. So our kids are very sensitive to it as well. When the refugee ban happened, kids ask questions about that. They want to understand it. They, one of the kids asked me, he's like, why don't they like us? What's wrong with us? Um, and I, when I share that with people, I, I think people are sometimes surprised by that, but yet I don't think they should be. I mean, whether they're experiencing it one-on-one, -on -one, we're seeing it in our, you know, they're, they're seeing it in their schools, they're seeing it when they're out in the community. And I think for us, one of the biggest things we can do is find the right places, the right spaces to be educating, and then also create experiences that um, require um, investing in relationship, whether it's support sports or not. Um, that's, that's how we've found you can really overcome a lot of those challenges. Okay. Uh, like that, so you had uh, both the experience of, of being a refugee and also working with, with, with refugees. So what, what are your thoughts about this topic? Yeah, I think um, from the ground basis, I think we also have to acknowledge that sports do have the power to eliminate a lot of this on its own. And I think what I do, particularly with the kids that I work with, that I let, I, I, I let the sport do the talking essentially, right? And I think when you are in a neutral space, when you are at practice, when you are at programming, we consider this as a safe space and we do a lot of different sort of activity that integrates a lot of our players together and doing activities that don't necessarily is, um, it's like challenging in a lot of ways. It's just creating this space where they can kind of play amongst each other in a very fun way. And I think sometimes we, don't remember how powerful that that can be when 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 kids are just kids and they are utilizing the space to just have fun and they often forget the di dynamics of race or bullying or all this other stuff and I think just understanding that when you are at a space as coaches we have to know that this we have to create this space as a safe space so that when they come here they're focusing on what is the most important thing and it's having fun and it's playing sports with each other um, and I think one other thing I would like to talk uh, say is that it's also so important um, to have role models, to have leaders who understand this. When you have a person who's running practice and do not understand this fully, it can actually go, it can actually affect in a very negative way. So um, having well-trained coaches to understand that when these sort of things happen, you don't necessarily have to sit and actually have a whole workshop around why bullying is bad, this and that, you know, and I think for soccer in particular is a safe haven for a lot of uh, refugee participants. The last thing oftentimes they want to do is come to soccer practice and talk about um, racial justice, right? And I think it's really important to acknowledge that that is, sport is an opportunity and it can help having those um, conversations, but it's also a great space for kids to just come and really um, express themselves and really learn. So I would say recommending that if you are working on a ground basis and you actually see you use face to face every single day, um, doing activities that don't that integrates a lot of them together and just basically just um trying to let them forget about all these things that's going on in today's society and just let them have fun and then um express themselves. Uh Thank you. Um another question that that um is asked uh, often in the chat is about sports uh, for refugees with uh, disabilities. And I would like to try something. I didn't warn him. So let's see. Charles Niembe, do you have do you have a camera or a microphone that you could, you could talk to us a little bit? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Charles is Special Olympics International in the Africa region. So, so uh, let us know a little bit and, and you know, the rest of the speakers. Let's think a little bit about this idea of integration of uh, refugees with disabilities, which is obviously, you know, for all the wrong reasons, it's, it's probably a big part of the of, of this. Yeah, thing. maybe. May, re, thank you so much. Appreciate Maybe really quickly to, oh, by the way, I'm located in Namibia. Um, uh, really quickly to begin with, um, the, we, 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 our intervention in terms of uh, people with disabilities started in Tanzania when we discovered, one of our board members discovered in the Nyarugusu refugee camp an, a, 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 an individual with intellectual, a refugee with intellectual disabilities from Burundi was chained 14 years 
every day in a mother's, you know, heart. So we went there, got our program in Tanzania to, you know, intervene and, uh, and we started a program. We trained coaches, we trained uh, refugees as coaches. We took the sport there. We trained those uh, women, the family members, those that have children with intellectual disabilities because they don't participate. In, even in refugee camps, they are marginalized. But we, we introduced what you called unified sports for people with and without intellectual disabilities so that they get accepted in the community. And we brought goalposts there with the support of Lions Club International. We introduced sports there. We, today we have you know, close to you know, 500 refugees that, are, that continue to, to participate in, in, in football and athletics. And the, the, the athletes in Tanzania, the refugees in Tanzania, participated in the national competition of Tanzania, regular Special Olympics. And some of them, including the young man, uh, Malaki, who was chained, who was chained, was liberated and participated in last, last year in 2019 at the World Summer Games of Special Olympics in Abu Dhabi. It, 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 Malaki back in, in the camp now is accepted. He's no longer chained the entire community around him. And we've reversed you know, these stereotype behaviors against people with, with disabilities. By the way, it's intellectual disabilities, uh, not physical disabilities, because phys Paralympics is, the, is physical disability. So we have programs now in Uganda, in Kakuma, in, uh, in Kenya, and, uh, and uh, the other camp uh, uh, um, in, in Kenya as well, the both camps, uh, and then and then in Uganda, we started programs in there. So we are reaching out to, to those with the intellectual disabilities and without, so the entire community bringing it together. And this only kicked off in 2018, but we're, we're gaining so much ground with the support of uh, you know, uh, UNICEF and also uh, with the Lions Club International providing the equipment and so on. We are providing the training to the coaches and family members. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Charles. Uh, remarkable work, and and uh, and we'll focus on this issue in one of the, our future webinars. So we hope to to have you again. So, any other uh, thoughts in, in connection to the to this topic? Um, you know, the idea of including um, you know persons with disabilities, uh, you know, marginalized communities. Um, anybody else who would like to say maybe maybe Nick um, a few thoughts? I mean, I, I think, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, in inclusion is one of the, the main objectives uh, of, of sports programming from our perspective. Um, uh, adolescent girls, uh, young people with uh, intellectual and physical disabilities uh, and, and, and LGBTI uh, young people who often find it very difficult to engage in, in sports activities. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's important to 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 work on inclusion of, of, of all marginalized groups, even, even young people from uh, uh, from from uh, marginalized ethnicity. So, um, you know, this is this is comes with different sets of challenges in, in different locations. And I'm sure, as uh, Dr. Ayat and, and Saren will uh, will recognize from 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 their work, uh, um, you know, inclusion it, it comes in comes in. In, in, in many different ways with many different sets of problems depending on the, uh, the situation, location and, and uh, uh, context. So, uh, I mean, it's something we have to consistently work at and then it's not something we have all the answers to, but, but I think that, you know, lots of organizations are making uh, really good progress in this area. Definitely. Sarah, any, any thoughts? Yeah, I think just the, um... In general, I think when you're looking at inclusion, it's looking at the experience of the child and who is it that um, impacts their life, who is part of their life to help them grow and integrate and become part of their new community and culture and looking directly and going to those people and working with them and, and educating them and providing ways to make connections with these youth. And I think I can't stress that enough that, you know, we look at sports and sports is the conduit that brings them together. It's the place that allows our kids to be, you know, free and, and enjoy themselves. But once they leave the soccer field, um, 
they have a lot of other influences in their life. And I, I think caring for the whole child and connecting with those who influence them is something we shouldn't overlook as well. Definitely. Okay, let's try to get through as many questions as possible from the chat. Anna, uh, you, you, you followed what's going on on the chat. Any, anything? Uh, yeah, yeah. Have? We have lots of questions and I will start with uh, one very interesting question we have. Uh, it's about award integration that we often want sports to help refugees with. How are we defining integration and could it be more standardized? How do or we should measure integration with these uh, programs? So let's start with Dr. Ayat. Thank you. Actually, I would like to add something to what uh, Nick mentioned because this has really brought another idea to me as a social work professor that we design intervention programs to work with refugees. And this is my area. So I'm really specialized in um, social work with immigrants and refugees. I have a special focus on um, the integration of Syrian refugees in the labor market, but also have this creative arts like art and sport. And how can we employ sport and art as ways of intervention? How can we include sport and art as way of um, intervention programs. And let me say that frankly, that UNHCR, UNICEF and the big INGOs, they contributed highly and in a very um, advantage way to uh, promote sport uh, inside the camps, as I said, more than outside the camps. The, the majority of the, the attention usually goes to the uh, inside the camps. A huge number of NGOs worked since 2011 in Jordan. And this is really brought also new positions, new uh, jobs to uh, sport teachers. Let's say that uh, frankly. So while employing sport teachers, this is affected um, or it has a positive impact on the job labor market because before that, sport teachers, they only have a very small opportunities to join the, the labor market because of the situation. Now, I really want to focus on kids who has trauma, as we know. That the trauma is a serious issue um, in refugee kids who um, fled war. And uh, during at Saturday camp, when the kids hear any airplane coming out, uh, you know, above the camp, they're really uh, scared of that. They have nightmares. So, in some ways, um, we want to include such activities. But also, I think we can have sport as effective uh, activities to also. Uh, deal with uh, traumatized kids. This is the, the main issue that I want to, to, um, to. For integration, uh, it's a very complex concept. We cannot really say that integration is one thing, but at least to say inclusion, which is something we can. And when we speak about inclusion, we are not mentioning only the uh, kids with disabilities, but also female, uh, because sometimes people think, oh yeah, uh, in Jordan, female are not participating. You will be surprised if you went to Zatari camp, you will see that the number of females who joining uh, the football games or uh, the Taekwondo is really higher than the, the boys. So uh, we really also to work on um, the misconception about uh, the Middle East or Jordan. And this is really, uh, I wish we have an opportunity uh, to have people coming and see how this really improved in Jordan. We don't have this kind of like gender issue um, as before or how the people perceive it. So I want to highlight that as well. Thank you. Anyone anyway, else about the defining the integration? Nick? And I, I, I have to agree with what Dr. Ayat just said that um, I, I think it's much more about inclusion and integration. Integration is the word of the wording of politicians. Um, and, and what we are interested in is making sure that, that young people feel welcome and included uh, and, and that uh, there are cohesive societies. So, I mean, I think I, I echo that. Okay. Sen, do you want to add something? I mean, I, I think uh, just going to probably repeat <laughs> Nick and Hyatt and looking at really its um, inclusion. It's really so. I'm just let's see. Let's see if he's agree with inclusion. Sorry, what was that again? Sorry, you kind of went out a little bit. Defining the word of integration. In, yeah, I think. Sorry, go ahead. Continue. Yeah, 
That's this is what the, the question about should we define it like an integration and how we measure it? Yeah. I it's the same thing. I think oftentimes it's just um same, same thing as everybody said. Inclusion is one of the biggest things. And I think um I just want to go off Dr. Hyde's um trauma uh conversation is that um I think I think that's also a whole a whole di uh, different feel, and I just want to acknowledge that, and I want to thank you for bringing that up because that's something I was thinking about as well. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. Perfect. We have uh, another question from Brian from Coaches Across Continents. He he wants um, uh, to talk about differences, challenges, and effectiveness experience of programming inside and outside UNHCR camps. Uh, at CSC, they have done a bit of both, but curious others' perspectives. Who, who will start? Yeah, I can say something about yeah. that, actually, Anna. Yeah. Yeah, um, sure. Although I mentioned that uh, most of attention went uh, to the refugees inside the camp, but this is also was in the phase of emergencies. So. In the beginning of the crisis, everyone, all the organization worked in emergency. But now everyone working on development, which means that all of these organization moved part of their work from inside the camp to outside the camp. And Erbit specifically where I locate, which is the north of Jordan, um, the population of Erbit increased uh, actually 20 percentage uh, of the uh, above Jordanian. So uh, in this case, uh, we can see the differences. So the majority of refugees are located in Amman, but the difference is that they are more clustered in Erbit than in Amman, the capital where they are more scattered. So to say that, frankly, although, as I said, it was most, most of the attention happened inside the camp, but now the majority of the organization, they are working outside the camp, taking into account the percentage of 85% of refugees residing outside the camps, which means that more interventions more activities, more services are reaching more people outside the camps. Perfect. Uh, anyone else? Nick? Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, uh, I mean, just to just to reiterate, I mean, I think that, uh, um, you know, when we when we look at uh, the refugee situation globally now, more than 70 percent of the world's refugees are, are, are outside of camps. Um, and UNHCR has an out of camp policy because, uh, you, you know, being in a camp does not uh, does not uh, enable refugees necessarily to access their human rights and to have a dignified existence. Now, that's not saying necessarily either that being uh, in a in a in a poor community in a in a uh, in a, an urban or a peri urban area that area does either, but it provides more opportunities uh, for for engaging with 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 host communities for employment for for education within national systems. Uh, and for accessing uh, rights uh, along with uh, along with host communities, uh, at, you know, at, as they as they become available. So, uh, I mean, from a from a UNHCR perspective, uh, you, you know, the the uh, the out of camp um, uh, position is 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 the preferred one. And then, and then, you know, what does that look like in terms of in, in terms of uh, programming and development? So, in, I mean, in Jordan. You know there is a there is an agreement with uh, the government of Jordan that uh, you know a, a percentage of all development and, and humanitarian funding goes to the host community as well as to the uh, as to refugee uh, refugee communities and the programming is for both communities and this is something that UNHCR is uh, you, you know uh, promoting very very heavily and, and something that we do with all of our funding we ensure that you know it, it benefits uh, um, both refugee and, and and host communities so. Um, I mean, I think uh, um, the final thing is that um, sometimes it's, uh, I mean, I think the, the, the point about Zatari and, and Azraq specifically, you know, having more sports activities, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a closed environment and, and, and is easy in many ways for, uh, you know, in the, in, in, the, uh, in the early days with the, with the Zatari camp, especially, there was a lot of European uh, sports organizations uh, um, and clubs that were investing money and sending coaches and, and you know supporting infrastructure development within the camp because it's uh, it's a kind of closed safe environment uh, it's it's much harder to work with refugee communities who are who are integrated into the 
into the host communities in Amman. Uh, and but this is really where the where the development and humanitarian money needs to be spent. And yeah, I'll stop there. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else wants to answer? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. I would like to highlight and thank the role of volunteers. So in many ways, um, we receive in Jordan a large number of volunteers who come to do just a volunteer work either in the camps or outside the camps. So it's it's really appreciatable. Uh, we really appreciate that from our uh, colleagues and our uh, friends uh, from either the uh, Arab countries or the Western countries. We really need to highlight the role of volunteers in promoting sport as well and uh, art. Thank you. Perfect. And uh, last questions, very briefly, from Tim Steckler. Uh, could you discuss the gender difference in access to sports programs through your work? How do you work with respect to the various cultures refugees might come from, but still providing equal access to sports for all genders? So, Dr. Ayat, I think you mentioned uh, a bit earlier, so maybe you can discuss more. Yeah, actually, thank you, Tim. Uh, Tim is one of the authors for this paper, actually. Uh, and we already published together uh, one paper that uh, I will be very glad and honored since it's published to share it with you as well uh, through the email. You can also um, send it to our colleagues who are interested. Um, actually, taking gender into account, this is actually within the policy, either in the camp or outside the camp. So sometimes when it's needed, we have a female teachers. So almost half of our uh, teachers that we interviewed are female who work in the female uh, schools. So we have uh, sometimes mixed gender uh, activities and sometimes it, it's really depend on the, but to be honest, inside the camps, we don't have that and a big issue. So the teacher can be a male and the, 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 the kids who join uh, this kind of sport are females and males. So uh, we don't think in sport it's a big issue, but uh, according to the cultural and religious aspects, it's preferable that the female uh, take the role of the teacher for the male, the female uh, students. Um, in research, as I said, it's very important for our research to have equal perspective. This is why we decided that half of the teachers that we want to interview to be female and other half to be male. Um, and this is very important for uh, our results as well. Thank you. Saren, can you, can you describe how you do that? Yeah, it's a little bit, um, we find a little bit of a challenge. So we have our soccer camps and we specifically have groups that um, actually we give the girls choices if they want to be part of the girls group or they want to be part of the larger um, boys group. Um, so the girls choose what they want to do, which is kind of fun. And then really in our other camps and other opportunities for the most part they're integrated and um yes it can be a challenge and i think that the it, for us i think it's listening to the parents and what the parents are comfortable with and, and having the conversation with the parents and, and what that means and trying to find resources and opportunities that allow us to welcome both girls and boys um, into our programming, whether it be separate, combined, and just really listening to them. Perfect. Yeta, do you have anything to say? Yeah, I think I want to reiterate a little bit of um, Dr. Ayat about the female coach. I think that's one of the key um, components of having a successful um, uh, uh, programming for um young women and I think um, definitely creating a, a safe space where whether that's physically or emotionally or mentally, um, whatever that that may be. Uh, I think also providing the same resources as the boys, um, really, really important, whether that's equipment, soccer shoes, you know, sometimes you have to understand the littlest things matter, like when the jersey doesn't properly fit a, a person, um, it, it does affect in a lot of ways, so finding that. And lastly, um, Volunteers, I think um, finding volunteers who share the same background or the cultural background as them and making them feel a, a sense of belonging, I think that's one of the ways you can really help achieve um, a great programming side of it. And I think for us, for outreach, um, oftentimes, you know, it takes one person to join the program and then that one person kind of tell her friends about the program and really utilizing the leaders in, in, in your group. and. Um, 
a- asking them, hey, you, you know what, um, really lead your group by um, encouraging other players to come and make them feel a safe, uh, a safe space and a sense of belonging. Because I think one of the biggest things is just like a lot of time, a lot of our female participants struggle with like they're not good enough or, or uh, they're embarrassed or that they don't think that they should do this because culturally that's something they shouldn't do. Um, and I think it's really important to break all those barriers and let them know that we personally, as program coaches, we are glad that you're here and this is a space for everyone. And we will meet you where you're at, whether if you feel like, I don't feel comfortable practicing next to the boys, let's go somewhere else. Um, or, hey, I want to practice with the boys. Okay, let's integrate you. And I think it's really important to understand that we have to meet them where they're at and we have to provide the same resources. Okay, perfect. Nick, do you have anything? Uh, always, I think, but uh, um, uh, I mean, I think, I think also uh, sometimes the the the, sit, sit, the situations provide opportunities for positive disruption, um, uh, where you know we can, in a, in a very respectful way, challenge cultural norms that 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 may be uh, uh, gender biased, um, and, and I think that 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 sport can provide that opportunity at times. And we've seen it on, on multiple occasions. I'll leave it there, thanks. Okay, perfect. And before switching to Vlad, I want to ask all our speakers, please write uh, your emails on chat because I see there are many questions and I'm sure that our participants will want to get in touch with you. So please um, write your emails in the chat and I'm switching to Vlad. Uh, thank you, Anna. So before going to uh, Brian, the sports diplomacy program officer, uh, to say a few words, I would like to, you know, kind of one sentence, if I, somebody asked Maria Bramido from Greece, uh, you know, one sentence, what is the biggest challenge in your view for using sports for refugee integration, you know, you know whatever work you, you do or you observe? So, you know, one, one sentence, try to summarize your thoughts. So uh, let's put pressure on Nick again. Um, uh, one sentence, uh, I mean, I think, uh, sustainability, um, uh, you know, how do we, and, I, and I'm thinking about refugee, you know, refugee context in, in the global South, how do we sustain refugee projects and how do we, uh, continue to keep refugee young people and communities engaged? Um, uh, we can, we can employ them as, uh, as facilitators and trainers and coaches, but, um, you know, people people naturally want to progress, and um, and they need to uh, to earn to earn money to live. So, I mean, I think sustainability is is a key issue for me. Thank you, Bertert. What do you think? One challenge that you want to refer to when you work with refugees. Your mic is on. Uh, yeah, I think um, one one thing that challenge let's see it's along the line of sustainability i think most nonprofits oftentimes struggle with um asking for help and i think a lot of oftentimes we try to do everything and i think being open and being aware of like there's a lot of different organizations out there that do good things and integrating ourselves with them and really understanding the biggest goal here is youth development and refugee integration and i think um one challenge we, we face is that we are constantly evolving and it's really hard to keep that pace and uh, understanding that when we are evolving, sorry, if the program in the world is evolving, we need to evolve with them and whether whatever that um, evolution may be, I think it's important to kind of keep up with them. And I would like to um, uh, really um, say that um, it's, it's important to um, look at other people, what they're doing and really integrate your, yourself with them and try to partner with them and do things together. Definitely. Hopefully this webinar is ho- hoping in that direction to bring people together, yeah. share experiences. Seren? Yeah, um, this is an interesting, probably one of the, the biggest challenges we have is, um, in working with our youth is logistics and uh, partnership. And I know that kind of sounds strange, but many of our families, um, the parents work all the time. And so it's hard for the kids to get places in and do things. And I think looking at, you know, partnerships is key to the success and sustainability of programs. It can't be done by with one group. And I know I'm kind of repeating what, <laughs> what was just said, but 
it's so important to the success of the program. And, you know, we rely on volunteers. We rely on translators. I mean, translators are huge. We work with the most recently resettled. And so communicating with our families alone and really just creating a, a safe space. And um, just, there are a lot of logistics that have to overcome for participation. And when partnership comes together and when people join forces, um, we can really achieve a lot more and our kids can be um, more holistically um, cared for. Thank you. Dr. Ayat? Uh, I believe the challenging aspect is how the people, the perception of people towards sport. So we really need to work hard on the perception and give the sport and art as well. I always connect art and sport. This is how I uh, look to them because they consider in Jordan as extracurricular um, activities. Uh, many people, they really underestimate the power of um, sport in intervention, the power of sport on uh, different aspects related to well-being of refugees. So I believe that we need to work hard to have sport as essential part of our interventions, intervention, sorry, and also part of our educational system, a strong part of our educational system. Thank you, and and this is uh, all these thoughts are, are to be to be built on um, in your work, in our work together, in hopefully what is the cooperation that resulted from. Um, you know, sending uh, information on, on contacts in the chat room and the discussion that you have had. Uh, Ryan, um, Ryan is a program officer from Sports Diplomacy US State Department. I know that um, he traveled with one of our programs uh, last year. I don't know, uh, time, time gets compressed right now during COVID. It was at some point in the, in the past and, and he visited the refugee camp with the Taekwondo program in Jordan actually made a strong impression on him. I know from his email and his feedback. So what do you think um, in general about the issue? A few thoughts uh, at the end of this, of this webinar, Ryan Murphy? Yeah, so first and foremost, I mean, again, this is another great panel session, great webinar that we're learning, Vlad, Anna and others have put on. So thank you to all the panelists, first and foremost. Uh, as Vlad said, within the U.S. Department of State, we use sport for social change as kind of our overarching theme, and we focus those programs and do those programs through a variety of different avenues. And within the International Sports Programming Initiative, we worked with World Learning to do a Taekwondo program in Jordan. We sent a group of American youth and coaches over to do the program there. Uh, we had the uh, opportunity to travel to the Azraq uh, refugee uh, camp and working with the Taekwondo Humanitarian Foundation who has a facility uh, in the camp up there. We were able, able to do some outreach with the Syrian refugees. And it was just such an amazing atmosphere and environment. And it was such an amazing experience for the American group that we brought there. Uh, it was the first time that any of them had had any interactions really with uh, refugees uh, in that setting. So it really was eye-opening. And this is not the first time that the Sports Diplomacy Division has worked with refugee populations. Uh, we work closely with Soccer Without Borders uh, on a number of programs. A number of years ago, I had the opportunity to travel out to Oakland to see the program firsthand out there. And we had a group from Nepal that was with us and visited the group out there. And it was just, again, such an amazing atmosphere and environment for them to be involved in. Um, so thank you to Soccer Without Borders and thank you to all of our partners that are on here today. Uh, I feel like most of them on here we've worked with in, in one way or another. And it was interesting, Nick had mentioned that the, the sports side of UNHCR is, is a relatively new avenue for them. And we, within the Department of State, we have a Bureau of uh, Populations, Refugees and Migration. And I know they work closely with Nick and with the team and we do do some sports programs uh, for refugees. So hopefully we can increase those those initiatives, those programs over the years, um, through all of our programs, we 
we strive to reach out to refugees in, in all walks of life and at all corners of the globe. So yes, to me, to bring it full circle to Vlad's initial point, yeah, it, it had a very uh, big impact on me going to the refugee camp uh, and the work that we do and seeing how we can utilize sports to really integrate communities is just a great thing. And all the work that you all are doing in your various organizations um, really has an impact on a number of people. So thank you all. Thank you, thank you, Ryan. Um, yeah, we have many other questions. Unfortunately, we'll have to, uh, and here hopefully we'll continue this, um, you know, in the future, um, you know, with um, the speakers and the participants in the chat room. Just want to remind you that this has been um, a webinar part of the International Sports Programming Initiative of the State Department, Sports Diplomacy Division, produced by World Learning and Digital Communication Network. Uh, thank you so much for to the speakers, uh, the audience, the participants, everybody who um, you know subscribed to this, um, you know, join this this webinar. And we are going to send a video recording to everybody who registered. Um, you know, for everybody to have an opportunity to actually watch or watch again uh, this webinar. So, um, you know, let's hope for, considering the fact that, you know, Anna is talking from Armenia, let's hope for peace in the world. Uh, thanks for everybody who has been involved in uh, producing this, um, you know, Anna, Aaron, Laurel, Laken at, at World Learning. Uh, so from here in, in Washington, despite my tropical forest type of background, thank you so much. Uh, have a good day and stay safe.